This is a uh, discussion that goes pretty far back for me. I've always been interested in a more accurate representation. Um, well, I, I put something in a, in a book about uh, a few years ago. Uh, there's a book called The Printed Circuit Handbook, edited by Clyde Coombs. It's a good book, McGraw-Hill. And um, I wrote the chapter on signal integrity. Um, so what I've always been interested in is anything that can be done in kind of a mass market sense to improve signal quality and our understanding of the bad things that the mechanical world, your world as part of a fabricator, um, the bad things that the manufacturing part of the world, the physical world, does to electrical behavior of signals. And as part of that, <clears throat> it's, it seemed to me that there's a bit of ambiguity that could be controlled and resolved in the laminate space. The, the raw materials for the dielectrics and the copper that make up a printed circuit board. So myself and the founder of CCN, a measurement lab, um, got together and we've been working on a uh, kind of an every man's VNA for measuring material properties. As part of that, um, we've been working with some test samples from various laminate vendors and doing our own characterization as a function of frequency of things like dielectric constant and loss tangent. Um, so that's what we've been working on. It's not on the market yet, but our intent is to give OEMs and fabricators um, a tool that's plug and play, PC compatible, and you can, you can take raw materials, laminates, and you can do your own in-house characterization of those materials from multiple vendors, any vendor. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a box with a measurement, you know, with a measurement piece for, uh, as a cavity resonator, and it plugs into the USB port of your PC and reads the data and you control it from your PC. I would say analyze and capture the data through the, through the so, so with the application, which is my Z Planner software, um, so the Z Planner software would then allow you to take your measurement data in your own library that you built, where, where you would use the same methodology for testing every laminate that you use, and you would read it right into your own library that you own, and you would design boards with that. Um, one of the questions I was also asked, sorry to, if I'm stepping over the line here, but one of the questions I was also asked is whether I think <clears throat> that this data, our data, will be different than what the laminate vendors provide. I try not to prejudge data so that you don't prejudice the results, but we believe that our results are going to be different and the reason that we believe that, there's a couple of reasons. There's about 11 different IPC methods for characterizing laminate materials. Well, there's not about, there are 11. And it's, uh, you know, it's this, you know, this standard, that standard, and the other one. And they're all different, and it's, and they're all good in their own right, but there are 11 different standards. You, you can't have 11 different standards. Uh, to be a standard, there needs to be one to be effective and useful. So everybody, I'm speaking loosely, everybody uses the standard to characterize their laminate material that favors their material. The marketing guys advocate for that. So if one measures a DF of 0.005, and another one measures a DF of 0.009, which one do you choose? The one that said 0.005. Well, in, in our thinking, um, what if there was just 
one thing you used. Like, I mean, it happens to be our tool, but it's sort of smarter from an engineering standpoint. What if I took all the laminates that I use or that I'm considering, I use one of those 11 methodologies that IPC says are okay, and I characterize all my laminates that way and design my PCBs with them. Seems like a smarter idea because a lot of what we try to do is make trade-offs between material A, B, and C. So we, we account for all of that. Resin content, thickness, frequency, all the things people care about, and you control it at your own test bench. bench. So to, to the degree that you can get the samples, you can slap them in to the, uh, uh, to the, to the measurement fixture, and off you go. And it's, it's really easy. It's a good question. It's a cavity resonator method. And we are still um, experimenting with a few different methodology standards. And I would say that by the time DesignCon rolls around here, you know, four or five months from now, I'll be able to give you a more firm answer on where we where our final destination is. Yeah, I don't know that I would want to, if I'd be qualified to go into the physics of it, but basically um, I'll, I'll talk, talk to you about some of the trade-offs we made as, as a comparison. So a lot of people realize that the closest thing you could come to an actual PCB would include copper. In other words, the strip line based methodologies um, you know, SPP is one, S3 is one, Breskin strip line. There are various uh, strip line techniques. Um, in our case, we're considering those, but we're gravitating towards uh, strict dielectric based methodologies. And this is a real time discussion internally. Um, so I would even welcome feedback from from you or anybody seeing the video. Um, we're trying to come up with something that, that we think would be a generic, widely used approach that's still accurate. I will admit that when you add copper, you're adding a degree of loss that's hard to anticipate without copper, wherever that may come from. So, and a lot of people don't realize, like I taught a class yesterday on uh, material selection and stack up design. And a lot of people don't realize that when you buy copper as part of a PCB, it doesn't have the same conductivity or bulk resistivity that copper would have in a physics textbook. It's about 20% lower. And uh, speaking from memory, these numbers could be wrong. Um, I think a, a textbook may, see, may say like uh, 4.8 Siemens per meter for the conductivity of copper. Well, in a PCB, it's about 3.9. Why is that? Why is it lower? I think they can be lower. Yeah, and that's loss. That is signal loss. Uh, so that's one source of loss. There's copper roughness. There's uneven surfaces which tie to roughness. Um, so all of these come into play. So we're, um, myself and Don, as part of CCN, are experimenting with a bunch of different methodologies and we're trying to come up with the lowest common denominator approach that could be used by everyone, anyone and everyone to capture their own laminate data. Um, at this time, we are leaning towards a cavity resonator approach, which is based on clamping onto the dielectric. Mm -hmm. We may end up doing a strip line version of it as well. We haven't decided. But, but part of what we're focused on is price. Uh, VNAs, as you probably know, as part of Sierra, uh, can be pretty expensive and a lot of people don't have them. Um, so we're, we're trying to get our price down to a price point where probably everyone could afford it, even down to small companies. We're trying to isolate the impact of copper. 
um, because I think that's a whole nother discussion. What, pop, what part does copper contribute? Because you can measure, D, and people do, DK and DF without considering copper, or you can measure it with copper. But when you get on an actual PCB, uh, the loss and the DKs are usually higher than what people expect them to be. I don't know if that's your experience at Sierra, but most people are of the view, and I'm of the view, that usually what you experience is higher loss and higher DK than what you thought it was going to be. And the reasons for that are, um, you know, still under discussion. Um, copper's part of it, copper conductivity, like I said, copper roughness. How is a transmission line based methodology different from a straight dielectric approach? Um, both of them will give you numbers. How different are they? So, so Don and I are discussing and measuring all of that. Fortunately, uh, my advantage in partnering with a guy like Don is he's got a ton, he's independent, so he doesn't, he doesn't work for a laminate vendor, he doesn't work for an OEM, he doesn't, you know, uh, he doesn't work for a copper manufacturer. He has tons of independent test data, historic independent test data. And so I get the benefit of all of that experience. And uh, we're, we're kind of looking for the holy grail here. And we're defining the holy grail as something that everyone can use. We don't want some tool that, you know, costs $50,000 that you need a, a PhD to run. We want something that anybody could run and, and we're aiming for 20K range for the price. We're targeting having it out by DesignCon, which is in, uh, we're actually giving a paper at DesignCon that uh, addresses the methodology and it'll use some of the samples that we received from Sierra, in fact. Um, the Isola iSpeed samples. And we're also trying to get some samples from some of the Asian manufacturers, possibly others. We want kind of a cross-section. And uh, we, we hope to be able to ship by uh, early next year, which is 2019. We, we haven't even named it yet. Do you want to know what our code name is? Please do. This could be the real name, but I'm, I'm wide open to suggestions. Uh, get ready to chuckle. Um, I named the tool in a meeting we had the Magical Mystery Tool. It doesn't have a name. We, we're also considering the Commando 450, which was the name of the shower head in Seinfeld that Kramer used. But uh, MMT, you could also say that that means Microwave Material Tester. So we might, we might call it the MMT. We might name it Allegro. I don't know. We're, uh, we're thinking about it. Yeah, we're, we're considering uh, Pentium, Itanium, Kleenex, All kinds of EMs. Chevy, Oldsmobile. We're considering various brand names that sure. Nike. Part of the reason that I form my, com uh, my company uh, and, and this is, you know, on a, very, on a very serious note, it kind of amazes me that um, OEM engineering teams will spend 60 hours laying out a board, they'll spend 40 hours doing signal integrity simulations and iterations, and you add that up and it's about 100 hours. If you told me that there was a planet where engineers and PCB designers would spend, and that's not even the schematic, that's just the physical layout and the signal integrity simulation of a board and troubleshooting. If you told me there was a planet where people would spend 100 hours on that and they'd only spend two hours on the stack up, working with the fabricator, I'm sure, but two hours on the stack up for something that takes 100 hours and the stack up is the foundation of the board. It touches every signal. And yet engineers and CAD designers only spend two hours on it. What's that all about? I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even believe you if you told me that, but that's the world we're living in. And, and I've felt for a long time, not just recently, but
for the last 20 years that, that engineers should spend and CAD designers more time on the stack up uh, than we do. Um, I've been uh, sort of a fan and a disciple of uh, Lee Ritchie's books for a long time. And of all the high speed authors out there, and there's a lot, lot of them, and I have all of their books, I buy all their books, and uh, Lee is the only one that spent a significant amount of time on stack up design. And I think if you're looking for that last 10 to 20 percent of signal quality improvement as frequencies continue to escalate, I think you really need to look at how you're modeling the stack up because the stack up itself touches everything and how you model the physics of the copper relative to the dielectrics is critical and that's that's what my company uh, focuses on that's what my software focuses on and that's my passion